Next speaker is uh, Andrea Costamagna from LSI Ecole Polytechnique, but Lausanne. So I said that uh, some years before. So uh, Andrea is talking about designing models using machine learning, in fact. So the stage is yours, please. Thank you very much. So yeah, um, about the, the project, the work I'm about to talk about is uh, uh, I'm in a work I did, I did back in 2020 in collaboration with uh, these amazing researchers. And it's about designing models using machine learning. And in particular, we will focus on this uh, physical object, which is the one body reduced density matrix. So before to dive into the problem, let's give you a, a little bit of background and of motivation. And everything started with some experimental motivations actually. So this is the synchrotron Soleil. And here people study the interaction of radiation with matter to extract properties of materials. So the basic experiment involves a material and you can position a detector at a given angle. And then you study the way that the, the, the light, the, the, the radiation interacts with matter in order to extract electronic properties of that material. Now, the fact is that these uh, experiments are very time demanding. And for this reason, experimentalists started to be interested in machine learning tools ever since they were proved to be effective in predicting properties of materials. So they started to question if it is possible to use machine learning to reduce the time needed for performing these experiments. That is basically to performing low accuracy experiments and then using machine learning to, to achieve higher accuracy. Now, this led to a more theoretical motivation which is um, if the machine can do it, is it possible to exploit what the machine is learning to get some theoretical insight? And this brings us to the LSI laboratory. So this is a more general problem because basically it is asking ourselves if can machine learning have an active role in model designing? That means not just blindly learning what output for a given input, but more some theoretical insights in the sense kind of learning with the machine in, in a way that I hope will be clearer by the end of the presentation. Now, that at the time there was COVID-19, so we did not have the possibility to get uh, a sufficient amount of experimental data to, to, to handle the first question. And so uh, apart from some preliminary study on uh, old experimental data, we focus more on uh, a more theoretically oriented case study, which is building functionals. That is uh, the, basically the topic of this presentation. Now, let's now dive into the, the physical object we wanted, to, to, we wanted to, 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 to analyze. And also let's try to figure out why machine learning could be a, a nice way to, to, to approach the problem and to study this kind of physical object. The statement of the problem. So we have a system in which there are n electrons like a molecule and we want to extract properties of this system. So the idea is that if we knew this object which is the many body wave function, well, we would have all of the information of the system. Because basically we know that any property, any observable, anything that we can measure can be computed in an exact way one, once we know this object, which is the many body wave function, because we just have to compute these complicated integrals and then we know the, the quantity that we can compare with the measurements. Now, this is called many body approach, it is exact, but the problem is that this object is too complex. And with too complex, we mean that it is almost impossible to know it exactly. And also if we knew it, it would be almost impossible to store that in in any existing computer, basically, because it would be, I mean, too, too, too memory intensive. So the fact is that uh, Kohn uh, introduced this density functional theory. And the nice thing is that it showed that the whole information of the system, I mean, can be encoded in a much simpler object, which is uh, a very intuitive object. It is just a scalar function of the three-dimensional space, which is the density of the, the, the system that we were considering before. Now, this is a very simple function and it contains the whole information of the system. And this implies that also the many body wave function in principle should be writable as a function of the density. And so for this reason, any observable in principle should be writable as an, a function of the density. The question is, what are these observables? Now, the fact is that we simplified the, ob the object containing the information with respect to the previous approach. And this comes at a cost, which is we don't have a systematic approach to to obtain these functionals. And only if you are known, in particular, the one body local uh, functionals. So there is the need for a more systematic approach. We have the density. We know that the many body wave function is a function of the density, which is, this is a, 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 key, a key information. And so we want to obtain a systematic way of finding these kind of functions. Now, before we said that we have these two information holders that contain the whole information of the system. And the idea 
was that is a we could introduce an intermediate quantity, like the one by the reduced density matrix, which is a little bit more complex than the density, but it's still far simpler than the many body wave function. And then this is interesting because, uh, well, it contains non-local information. And thanks to this information, a wider class of functional are, are known as a functional, as functionals of the one body reduced density matrix, like a one body local, just as before, but also non-local this time. So the idea is that uh, this object can be obtained as a, uh, just starting from the many by the way function. And this automatic implies that in principle, it should be possible to find the, the, the density function of the one body reduced density matrix. And if we are, if we were capable of obtaining that, we could substitute it into the formulas we have for the observables as function of the density matrix. And then as a consequence, obtain the function of the density. Now the goal becomes finding the density function of the one body reduced density matrix. And since there was almost no work to date, what we did was to start from the simplest many body problem, which is a 1D system with two electrons. Now, again, the goal. Uh, and why, why should we use machine learning at this point? So the goal was to find this one and in a 1D system. And we discretize the space in an NG number of points. This information is very important. And if we do that, basically we can rewrite this expression in these terms. So we have a matrix that is uh, mg times mg, which uh, is the dimension of the discretization. And the thing, the interesting thing about this object is that, uh, well, of course, each element must be a function of the density because the object itself is a function of the density. But the most interesting thing is that the diagonal itself of this object is the density of the, is the, density of the system. And so the, the thing is that uh, we should use machine learning because this object, or we could use machine learning, because this object is very strongly constrained. What I mean is that if we change just one entry, just one entry of the diagonal, this change will propagate to the whole diagonal because the density must sum to the number of electrons. So all the other entries must vary. And in this variation, there will be a propagation of this variation also to all of the off diagonal entries. And so this object is strongly constrained. Now, machine learning tools, as I was saying, and also as, as Jack was saying before, is very good at exploiting constraints that are present in the data set. And you can just think about how effective machine learning tools were proved to be in uh, image processing. And well, of course, pictures are very constrained objects. If I take a picture of you and a picture of a dog, for instance, well, there are some constraints that tells you that that picture is a picture of a person, not the, the picture of a dog, because the, the, the pixels are positioned in a constrained way, one with, with respect to the other. So, this is why we, it is reasonable to use machine learning. And, but uh, any machine learning tools need a data set. And so what we did, as Jack was saying, was to generate these families of randomly generated potential. And we populated them with two electrons. And basically we sampled these potentials at a number of points, which is the NG data points. We used the idea code to, to find the, the two body wave function in an exact way. And then starting from this, it was possible to find in an exact way the, the, the one body reduced density matrix that will, be, that, that will appear, appear in, in the forms of these metrics. We use color for simplicity to, 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 to explain the concept. So let's now dive into the, 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 the machine learning methods that we use. And let's start from principal components analysis. Now, principal components analysis is, uh, you will always find principal components analysis explained with this example. So what's the idea? You consider a data set of faces and each face is, uh, okay, it's a matrix, but you can flatten it uh, as a vector. And so we'll, uh, uh, we will describe them as vectors. Here is a pictorial representation. So basically each vector will be a point in, uh, in this, uh, this space. And, uh, and basically we want to, to, to study this, uh, this system. Now, what principal components analysis does is first of all to compute the average vector. So basically it finds a reference, which is the average phase, if you want, in these data sets. Once you have it, you can explain, you can, you can, uh, you can describe any point as a variation from this average vector. And so what the principal component does is then to find a, a, a set of vectors, which is basically a, a basis, a new basis, with which it is possible to, to describe this data set. And in particular, this basis that is the basis of the principal components is very, very interesting because the, the, the first principal component will be the components along which the data will most strongly co-vary. So um, basically the, 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 the data are, are, are as, as you can see here, have a strong variation along this, along this line. 
And, and so the, the first principal components exactly encodes this kind of information. And then this value sigma one tells you what is the importance of the first principal component. Then the second principal component will be orthogonal to the first one and will tell you what is the direction along which the data most strongly covary that is orthogonal to the first one. And again, sigma two will tell you what is the importance of this second principal component. As Jack was saying before, if the points were on a line, it would be automatically, this, it, it, it is easy to understand that this value sigma two would be equal to zero because the importance of the second principal component will be completely absent. So just understand, uh, there is the, the, the most important thing here is the, the so-called principal component decomposition. So the idea is this, if you give me your photo, what I can do is to represent your photo in these bases. So what I will do will be to take the average face, then I will take your face, I will subtract your face to the average face, and after that, I can uh, recompose your picture, which is gamma, it is a function of your name, by performing this decomposition, the average plus the projection of your face along uh, each of the principal components. And so basically these coefficients are the so-called, are, are basically some functionals of your name because they will tell you how much your face vary along the first principal component, along the second principal component, and so on. So the thing is that there are two important things about this. The first one is that, as we were saying before, the, the thing about, well, the data is constrained on a line, and so sigma two will, should, would be equal to zero, corresponds to say that if constraints are present in the data set, at that point, this principal component decomposition needs a reduced number of components to fully reconstruct the data. So principal components analysis intrinsically encodes constraints that are present in your data set. And the other interesting thing was that, well, we, we wanted to build functionals. And so, well, in the, doing the, the, the idea was that uh, the, your name corresponds to the density of the one body reduced density matrix. And so finding the functional or the function of the name corresponds for the one body reduced density matrices as finding these coefficients as function of the density. Let's go into the, into the details. Again, this is the, 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 the pictorial representation. And this time the data set will be a data set of one body reduced density matrices. So we perform PCA and we basically compute the average vector, which is again here reported in red, and we represent any one body reduced density matrix as the average vector plus a variation from it. Then we find the basis of the principal components, which are again the, 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 the direction along which there is the most informative covariation of the data. And they will be sorted by importance, where the importance are these, uh, these values. So again, the first principal component will be the direction along which the, the data most strongly covary and, and so on and so forth. Now, what does this mean in terms of our matrices? We have our matrices, which are NG times NG matrices. We transform them into vectors in the NG square dimensional vector. And well, after we have performed the principal component decomposition of these, on these vectors, then we can decompose any matrix as uh, the average vector plus a decomposition into that basis. And so finding the functional corresponds to find these coefficients and to, or to estimate them at least just as functions of the density alone. Now, the fact, as we said before, is that if there are constraints and we know that there are constraints because the density by itself, which is the diagonal of this object is constrained because it must sum to two, but also the, the matrix for instance is symmetric in the cases we consider. So there are ad additional linear constraints that the principal component analysis can learn. And in these cases, we need a reduced number of these coefficients. So we just need to estimate a few, a lower number of them. So the fact is that we noticed that there was a, a, a very, very useful one-to-one -one mapping and that we decided to exploit. The idea is the following. We start from uh, the data sets of the one body reduced density matrices and we computed the first principal component. So the most informative direction. And then we consider a, a subset of this data set which contains only the densities and we perform again principal component analysis, finding the first principal components on these data. Now, the interesting thing was that uh, we noticed that uh, if we scaled properly this quantity just by a scaling factor, it was possible to notice that there was a one-to-one -one mapping in between this object and this object. So what do we mean? Now, the, the, the green lines identified the diagonal subspace of the density matrices that correspond basically to the points in which we have the density. So the, 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 the dots identify this vector, which is the rescaled version of the first principal component of the density matrix dataset. 
and the, the, the stars identify the components of the, the, of the density in the enlarged space of the one by reduced density matrices. So of course, these components will have zero values everywhere it is not basically the density subspace. Now, as you can see, there is kind of an overlap in between these two quantities. And the, the, the nice thing indeed is that this quantity, which is the scaled version of the first principal component of the density matrix, contains some off-diagonal information. But if we focus ourselves on the subspace of the density, basically we have exactly the first principal components of the density. So how can we exploit this kind of information? Well, um, first of all, we have to notice that this does not hold only for the first principal components, but it holds for the first new principal components and this can be seen here. Here is basically the, uh, the, 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 the average is uh, the average and the standard deviation of the coefficients, the scaling coefficients that we need to map uh, each entry of the, 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 the associated principal components of the density matrix to the density. And as you can see, things explode at a certain point because basically there is no one-to-one -one mapping. So why is this interesting? Since there is this one-to-one -one mapping, uh, well, we can exploit this theorem. This theorem basically tells you that uh, if you take uh, any vector and you start from the average vector, and then you perform the, the decomposition in, uh, in the basis of the principal components, and you stop yourself at a certain value, that is basically the best linear reconstruction that you can do using only new vectors. So we can use this information because basically we can introduce this quantity. So what, what, what will be this quantity? This quantity will be the best linear reconstruction of the density with new components that will also carry some of diagonal information. Why is that? Well, if we look at this quantity, and in particular the average value, well, this is the average value of the one by the reduced density matrix. But the, the average is a linear operator, and the density appears in the diagonal of the one by the reduced density matrix. So the diagonal of this quantity must necessarily be the, dia the, the average density, and so it must be exactly this quantity. But what concerns this term instead? Well, this vector is nothing else than the density in the large space of the one by reduced density matrices. So everything that will not be diagonal will be zero. And for this reason, the only non elements that uh, will uh, appear in the, this color product will basically be the, 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 the components that will appear in the density subspace. And this automatically implies that computing this term or computing this scalar product is basically the same thing. So the fact is that the nice thing about doing this is that if we focus only on the densities of space, then we are exactly doing this thing. But since we are doing that with these new principal components, we are basically also bringing the, the information on the off-diagonal terms for free. So, here is the, the representation in a, more, in a more intuitive way. So we started from the density. We performed the best linear reconstruction of the density with new components, also carrying off diagonal information. So we used these, these new principal components. And as you can see here, there, this is a good reconstruction of the density. But also, in, if you look at the metrics, there is a, a, the, the, the off diagonal information, which is brought, brought in by the, 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 the values of the principal components. And then we use this as a, a starting point to basically reconstruct the 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 the, the exact the to, to reconstruct the exact result. What I mean is the following: we can use this as a first order approximation, and we can say that uh, well, the correction to be added in order to recover the exact result can be encoded in uh, can can be extracted by means of a machine learning model. Now, Jack before was talking about the denoising Gauss encoder, and we will come back to this later. But the idea is that uh, we already helped a lot of the machine learning models. And so if we had to start from scratch and to, to learn the one by the reduced density matrix just from the density, then the fact is that the machine learning models we, we would have used would have been much more complicated than we, the one that we, that we had to use. And we will see this in a while. So once finished with the principal components analysis, let's consider neural networks and feature engineering. Now, um, Jack has already talked about this, but uh, uh, well, uh, redundancy is never bad. So we have uh, the, the, the perceptron, which is basically a, nothing else than a parametric model that can be used to do linear regression. So we want to learn the, the value of a function, y, 
uh, as a function of the input uh, uh, v. And the only thing that we, we need to know is to learn these parameters that are w and v. Now, this kind of model can solve any linear regression problem. And here is an example. So the hand function is basically a linear problem because basically uh, the points that are here, that are here and are here. So will, will, if, if you evaluate the end function in this point, will always be false. Whereas the only case in which the end function is true is when both the inputs are true or one, and so only here. So you can write the end function as, uh, as exactly in, in terms of uh, a perceptron rule, because uh, the output of this function will be one, if the, 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 the input of the, the, the argument of the function is larger than zero, and it will be zero if the argument is lower than zero. So this is basically a, a problem for which linear regression is doable, and this is basically a linear classification problem. The idea is that you can separate the space by just uh, tracing this line. Now, the fact is that not all the problem can be solved with a, a linear regression model, and in case we had a nonlinear regression model, we have two possibilities to solve this problem. The first one is to exploit the universal approximator theorem that basically tells you that you just have to make the, 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 the model a little bit more complicated. But then this parametric model associated to, to this model, which is a little bit more complicated, can in principle learn any function that you want, provided that, of course, the, the activation function is compatible with the image of the function that you want to learn. The alternative is to encode some analytical inside and to map the problem to a linear regression problem. So the, the, the the usual example for this is the XOR problem. Now, this is exactly a binary classification problem, just as the end function. But this time, we cannot trace any line to, to perform a linear classification or a linear regression. But what we can do is to, instead of using the original feature, to map this original feature to new features that are the original features and an, an engineered features, which is basically the product of the two quantities, of the, of the two inputs. If we do that, basically what we are doing is taking the one one input and we are raising it into a third dimension. This is here represented. So we take the one one and we raised it to the third dimension. And in this way, the problem at this point becomes linearly separable. So we can solve a nonlinear problem with um, a, a linear model, just engineering the inputs. So now, why, why, why are we interested in this? Because, well, so far with the PCA, we just considered the linear constraint. We just uh, introduced a linear model, and then we had to use machine learning to recover the nonlinearity. Now we want to, to get some insight on the, on the nonlinearity of the problem. And for doing that, we consider the simplest possible system, which is the upper diamond. Now, this is interesting because it is the simplest non-trivial system. And also it is interesting because there are uh, analytical solutions in three limiting cases that uh, we will all, we will all exploit, we will exploit, exploit all of them. And we will exploit two now and one later. So the density matrix for this system is basically this two by two matrix. The density is a uh, mass sum to the number of electrons that are two in our case. And so basically, we will have that one value will be gamma one one and the other will be two minus gamma one one. This is one constraint. And then the, the matrix must be symmetric. So basically, these two terms must coincide. This means that uh, learning the density function in this case, the, 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 the density functional is in this case corresponds to find a scalar function of a scalar variable. Now, as we said before, we know that there are some limiting cases in which the, the density function is known in an exact way. And one is the non interacting case. The other is the strongly interacting case for which we have these two formulas. And here they are represented. So this is the non interacting case. And this is the strongly interacting case. Now, as you can see, the model is strongly nonlinear. So the constraints in between gamma 1, 1 and, and the output is, 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 are, are strongly nonlinear. And, and this is what we want to learn. Now, the, the, the starting point of our analysis was to try to teach the upper dimer to the machine. And the most straightforward way of doing that would be to exploit the universal approximator theorem, because we said that this network can learn any kind of function. Now, the thing is that uh, anyway, as we said before, the nonlinearity is very strong. And so we started to do this to, to try to, 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 to learn that with a multi-layered network, but that would have been brute force machine learning. And the, the network we needed was really overcomplicated. It was a, a very, it had a lot of parameters because the, the, the square root nonlinearity is a very tough one for the machine to learn. And so rather than going that direction, we noticed the following thing. So if you, work a little bit on the analytics of this formula. You notice that a very important term is gamma m, which is the minimum of the two of the of, of the two values of the density. Because if you do that, 
basically you can redefine these, um, these new variables, Z1 and Z2, in the case of the strongly interacting case and in the case of the non-interacting case. And if you do that, and what, what happens is that uh, both the expression can be written in this form. So uh, quantity Z1 to the power of something, that is a parameter, and Z2 to the power of something, which is a parameter. So we perform the exponential of the logarithm of this term. And what we see here is nothing else than a formula, which uh, I hope you remind is very similar to the, to, the, to, to the parametric model that is nothing else than the perceptron. So I will show it to you again. So we said here, we have a nonlinear function or here better, a nonlinear function of a linear combination of inputs multiplied by a coefficients to be learned plus a bias term. So here we are. This is exactly what we found. So we managed to cast these models into the form of a perceptron. So instead of using a very complicated network to learn this nonlinearity, we just need a single perceptron. That is the minimally complex architecture. So indeed, we used the, the back propagation to learn these parameters that are W1 and B, and we found what we were expecting. So W1 and W2 are both around 0 0.5, which encode the square root nonlinearity. And then the bias is almost zero because we, we put that only to, to, to recover the functional form of the perception. So this is basically the main take-home message of this, this presentation, which is that minimizing the complexity of the machine learning models basically corresponds to, to gaining analytical insight. So no rocket science, but it is a very, very useful way of approaching the problem. So, well, the fact is that now we have the, 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 the two limited cases that are the non-interacting case and the strongly interacting case. And the, the, the thing is that uh, is, we started to question if it was possible to, to, to use the insight that we gained while teaching the dimer to the machine in order to also extract all of the other interaction strengths. So all the other cases, interaction strength, strengths that were not either strong, either very strong, attend, uh, limits to infinite or absent. So what we noticed while doing this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this process was that the, 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 a very important variable is gamma m, which is the minimum in between the values of the density at the, at the two sides. Indeed, the two functional forms for the non-interacting and the strongly interacting case are very similar to each other. The only thing that changes basically is coefficient. And so what we postulated was that that thing was actually the only thing varying for all of the possible interaction strengths. Now, something that we can always do is to write this term as uh, the sum of two contributions. And so what we did was to write this term as the, function of, as the sum of the, 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 the same term evaluated in one plus a correction to that value. But why did we do that? Well, because the case in which gamma m is equal to one is the third case in which we can solve in an exact way the upper dimer. And so basically gamma to one can be found in an exact way as a function of the interaction strength when gamma m is equal to one. So the only thing that we had to do was to substitute gamma m equal to one and then to invert this expression to find this term. And this is the accuracy of the analytical model that we achieved as a function of the, of course, of the interaction strength. So this is again, the strongly interacting case. This is the non-interacting case. And these are all the intermediate values with the approximation that we have. So, well, uh, at this point, we could have proceeded with some perturbation theory or something to, to recover the exact, a, a, a better result. But what we preferred to do was to basically use the informed, in some way, deep, lear deep learning to correct the, the model. And again, the idea is that these models that we needed to achieve this accuracy, which is almost exact, was much simpler than any network that we tried to use to learn the, the, the one budget reduced density matrix from scratch for these two simple two, 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 two sides case. So this concludes the part about neural networks and feature engineering. And let's now go back to the concept of using the noising autoencoder, the, the, the thing that I told you before. Now, what are autoencoders? Again, Jack already told about that in a very, very good way. But uh, the, the idea is, as I was saying, that we have some input data. And the idea is that we want to reconstruct it at the output. And the way we want to reconstruct it is uh, by first encoding it, so to map it into a lower dimensional space, and then reconstruct it using this decoder and to reconstruct a higher dimensional information. Why should we do that? Because if the input is uh, as constraints, well, the encoder 
it's actually, it must actually learn these constraints because otherwise it will lose information because here it has a lower space in which it can store this kind of information. And so the encoder is forced to encode, to find the constraints that are present in the input data. And then the decoder must take this lower dimensional thing and must reconstruct the data. So these objects, the out encoders, are very good for finding the, 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 the forward and the inverse operator to, 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 to encode the constraints. Now, it is also interesting because in the case in which um, there are noisy data, if this thing has learned how to encode the constraints, even if we present an input data that has some damages into it, so there is some noise into that, well, these objects kind of know when something is meaningful and when something is not. And so these objects can be used to basically denoise, to remove noise from the input data, as just, just as Jack was, said, was saying. And so this is, was basically Jack's idea. So to, to, to basically consider, uh, to, 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 to use the concept of noise, to use the, the to, to, to use the to, to, to represent the approximation that we were doing on the one body reduced density matrix. So for instance, in the PCA case, what we were doing was to, to take a linear approximation of the model. And so we treated the nonlinearity of the model as the thing to be approximated. So the nonlinearity was uh, uh, the absence of nonlinearity was the noise present into the, the PCA estimation. Now again, this is what I was saying. So this is basically the, 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 represent, the, 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 the linear approximation of the functional, and this is the exact results. And so what you can say is that, well, the thing that are, that are missing here are basically the noise, and the noise is the absence of nonlinearity in the simple model that we had. Now, but now we know much more than that, because we know that the, we, we kind of know some, the nonlinearity in the, the, the one body reduced density matrix for the Hubbard diamond. So, we started to question if it was possible to exploit this thing in order to obtain uh, a, an approximate functional which encoded some nonlinear information. So what we did was to use the, the, the upper dimer. And in particular, we, we, we kind of padded the, the NG case. So uh, the, the, the case in which the potential is sampled at NG points by positioning an upper dimer per each pair of nodes. And we, we computed the one body reduced density matrix, so the off-diagonal and the corresponding off-diagonal entry by using the formula for the, the non-interacting case, the strongly interacting case, because we, we, we were hoping that, uh, well, we could tune the interaction strength in order to match what was the, the, the correct off-diagonal term given to diagonal term. So here is the representation. So just performing this simple approximation for the non-interacting upper dimer, these are the matrices that you obtain. And you have to compare them with the exact one body reduced density matrix. And again, we used a denoising out encoder in order to remove the, and, or to modify the, the, the points in which the, the, our simple model was failing in reconstructing, in, in, in estimating the one body reduced density matrix starting from the density. Now, there are two things that are interesting about these that are that, uh, uh, well, the, fact, the, the, interesting, the, the interesting thing is that we obtain the same result independently on the interaction strength. This is what I'm saying. So independently of the fact that we use the interacting dimers or the, the, the non-interacting dimers, basically we obtain exactly the same, uh, the, the, the same approximation, the same functional of the one body reduced density matrix as a function of the density. And the other interesting thing is that uh, when the model was doing it right, it was almost there was an almost exact um, estimation for, for many entries. And here that is represented in this, in this, uh, in this picture. So, but, but what is more interesting than anything? Well, the fact is that if we compare the, the, two, the two functionals that we considered, so the one that was constructed using the principal components analysis and the one that was constructed starting from the upper dimers, well, in both cases, we, we, we corrected the approximation using the same kind of neural network. So five convolutional layers, Jack told you about the convolutional networks. So basically we use the same architecture in both the cases, the same number of filters and the same dimensionality of the reduced space. And the nice thing was that uh, 
even if we consider the same architecture. In the case of the PCA, it was much, diff much more difficult for the network to learn how to reconstruct the correct one body reduced density matrix. And indeed, it needed the 200 epochs with respect to 50 epochs, where each epoch is the number of, is, uh, is in each epoch, we, 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 we consider all the data points in our data set. And also, the loss at which the, 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 the autoencoder in the case of the PCA functional uh, was, was worse than the one that we achieved for the, the case of the app paradigm. That again brings us to the same conclusion. So minimizing the complexity of the machine learning models corresponds to gain some analytical insight. So again, here there are some additional consideration. I will not go into the details of this, but the idea is that, uh, well, we tried to, uh, we decided to substitute the, 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 the density, we tried to brute force with a perceptron the, the value of an off-diagonal entry as a function of the diagonal. So again, the densities. But instead of using the densities itself, we decided to introduce the information of the nonlinearity that we discovered. And also, we used that activation function again, the exponential. And this was just a, pre a preliminary result, but just to show that actually the, 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 if we use the logarithmic perceptron, so this kind of information, this thing was capable of, of, uh, of dominating in terms of performance with respect to any other perceptron that we wanted to use, because we actually gained this, this insight, the insight about the kind of nonlinearity that is present in the data. So just to conclude, well, one might wonder what is the applicability of, the, 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 of, this, the, of this research? Well, there is some form of direct applicability, but this would be only for systems which are reasonably approximated by our system that is extremely simple. But then there is the method and the information learned. For instance, in, in the PCA, even if it was worse than the upper dimer estimation, we still discovered that there was a lot of importance of, uh, uh, of the linearity. And this can be, can be, can be used to build more data set free analytical models, which are maybe based on, 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 on these principal components and to the extraction of these linear constraints. And then there is, a, of, again, the, 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 the mantra of this presentation, which is that minimizing the complexity corresponds to maximizing the analytical insight. Then there is the fact that we found the function of the Abbar dimer in, uh, with this, this approximation for the function of the Abbar dimer. And this might be interested by itself because the, the Abbar dimer has been experimentally realized. And finally, there is the fact that, uh, well, as we suggested, the Abbar dimer might be a good candidate theoretical building block for more complex series. And indeed, we managed to encode the, the two limiting cases in the minimally complex architecture. And so in principle, this minimally complex architecture might be a good candidate building block for more complex architectures. And maybe it might be a, a cheap, it might be held, uh, in the long term to a cheap implementation in dedicated hardware to speed up the calculations. Now, to conclude, I would just like to, 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 to do some free advertisement because nobody's paying me for doing that. So uh, I want to do that anyway. I would like to, to say that uh, I would invite you to, to, uh, to check the research that these people are doing. These people are amazing. I enjoyed a lot working with them and uh, it, is, it is very good to collaborate with them anytime you can. And then I would also like to, to stress a thing that I, I care a lot about which is the, the dark side of deep learning, that is its carbon footprint. I invite you to have a look at this, this paper, which is a divulgative work that basically tells how much energy, uh, I, the, the problem that uh, deep learning can be uh, a big issue for, um, for what concerns the carbon footprint for it has a very big environmental issues. And that it is a, a widespread idea that this is mainly due to two things. That is, first of all, people often do a lot of brute force machine learning. And, and this is due to the fact that we still have a, a, a lack of theoretical insight on, on the learning methods in deep learning models. And also due to the fact that the hardware for doing artificial intelligence is not optimized at all. So I invite you to have a look at what uh, people are doing in, in this perspective. And so people are applying statistical physics for uh, gaining theoretical insight on how deep learning works. Whereas there are other researchers that are working on resistant witching effects. So these, uh, these memory stores or the, in general, these materials that can be used to build uh, hardware, which is optimized for artificial intelligence. And then there are these people that are working at the intersection of these uh, two fields in uh, dynamical systems.
So I thank you for your attention and I I am ready to answer to any question you might want to discuss. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you very much. Okay, floor is open for a, a discussion here and online. Okay. Can I um, start from the last point that you raised? Sure. Um, I haven't read that this um, um, this article yet. I will, um, but uh, this um, this point uh, about the optimized hardware. Okay, so I know for sure that uh, we partially are going to to address that because uh, in the preparation for the interactive session this afternoon, when uh, uh, Jack prepared his, uh, his uh, tutorial, I also did the tutorial and it was way, way slower than it was in his case. And he was simply using, for example, GPU and I was using my 40 CPU in OpenMP and I was much, much slower. So I know that this uh, certainly uh, a point here, and uh, I, I, I would ask you if um, I, I know I read about this um, uh, new, let's say, tensor processor of, for, of Google. Are they supposed to be a, a good viable uh, choice? Are this uh, in the in the in the direction of having a better hardware specifically conceived? as well as the GPU or uh, better or worse? What do you know about? Well, I personally don't know much. And I think that Jack knows much better than me. What I was talking here was mainly what physicists could do in terms of this uh, dedicated hardware. I, I, I maybe didn't, didn't stress this too much. But what I was meaning was that, I mean, there is uh, a lot the need for, uh, I mean, gaining more physical insight on how these resistive switching materials work in order to construct these memory stores that can be used to encode the, the, the parameters of the model. Unfortunately, I don't know so much about the thing that you're talking about, and I would be a fool to try to speak about that. So I'm quite sure that Jack knows much better. So if you want to ask him, I guess that he, he could handle this question much better than I could. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know. <clears throat> the, the TPUs by Google are, are certainly built for performance, but yeah, I've not looked at their um, impact. As in, if their, if their priority is to is to minimize the, the power consumption. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, they are conceived for uh, machine learning, for artificial so, intelligence. Yes, they are. Custom built hardware for exactly deep learning, or particularly like the, the TensorFlow framework. Yeah. yeah, because we have seen some way that uh, already the difference between your small GPU and my very new forty processor CPU. Uh, I, I was much slower, so there must be a, a, an acceleration factor there, very important. Well, I'm not sure what the total impact would be, because let's say it takes 10 times longer on the CPU. The GPUs have a higher power consumption. I don't know which would be more efficient in the end. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I have a very big desktop. I don't know if it's less time, less power consuming than your laptop. Uh, so I think there is a way there. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a other question, but first let's go with Andreas, please. Thank you, but you can continue with your question. No, no, it's, uh, no, 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 it's fine. Okay, no, no, mine was um, uh, back to slide around, um, uh, it was uh, 23 maybe, where you, um, Even before that, um, yes, here. Um, so at the end, uh, you, so go a bit further away when you, yes, here. Okay, I, I didn't understand if uh, this uh, form for the, uh, for the density matrix, the non-diagonal, with this exponential, if at the end it was uh, 
an ansatz because you know more or less what to look for or uh, if it was really the obvious answer well it was of course it was induced by the um, yeah what you're saying is right so uh the thing is this this manipulation was only possible because we knew the exact functional form of the one body reduced density matrix in these two two sides case yeah because so, you have the constraints and so exactly mm -hmm. so once you know that you are capable of doing this uh, this manipulation that allows you to 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 represent the input data in the most informative way but representing the data in the most informative way corresponds to basically yeah encode the the analytical insight that you have on the model so yeah of course it is it is it is kind of the tricky thing about the, the feature engineering because also in the XOR problem you you, you have to know how the, the, the what, what is the structure of the, the data in order to exploit it and to 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 map it into a linearly separable problem and here is basically the same thing yes so this this thing needed an, an analytical knowledge in order to be exploited Okay, so that means that uh, this uh, analytical knowledge uh, can also be given even when the system is more complicated uh, than uh, the, the two-side Hubbard model. No, it, it would have been uh, maybe a bit more complicated, but you still exploit that as far as you can write in an, in an analytical way constraints, right? Yeah, so uh, in this specific case, we knew all of the constraints. So we know exactly the functional form of, the, of diagonal terms. And so in this case, it was super easy. But still, the, 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 the interesting thing is that apparently, the more you manage to encode the constraints, the simpler is the complexity of the network that uh, you need in order to achieve uh, an almost exact result. So what uh, what we mean here is that we here, here we basically encoded the whole information of the system. So basically, you, you can map this to a logarithmic perceptron because there is basically nothing else to learn by 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 the black box that we are using in order to to obtain the final approximation, the, the final the final the final object. Yeah. But still, what you are saying is right, and it is very in line with what what, what other speakers were was telling before. So if we just uh, introduce some partial knowledge, some partial knowledge on the constraints. Still, it is it is to be expected that the, the black box that we will need will be, of course, simpler than the, the network we would need in case we did not have any knowledge at all. So in principle, this would be something like driving your uh, research toward the minimization of the network. That means it tries to encode the, the, the information in, in the way in which you present the data to, the, to, to your black box, which is the machine learning model. I don't know if I answered to your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. And it makes sense, of course. Thank you. Um, okay, so there was uh, Andreas, and then we have someone here. So, Andreas, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, again, a few points, but maybe I start. I don't know. Should I, uh, uh, well, some, well, you started with advertisement, so I may. Um, uh, I found that this is your emphasis on the diagonal. Uh, maybe extend it to something, some other quantity of um, interest that is the response function. Because for year, years ago, we looked at simple system, it's a accurate response function, a static across, along the adi adiabatic connection. And we found there also some kind of dominance of the diagonal. So we thought if we master this, we can master the rest. So maybe it will be kind of natural extension of what you need for the density matrix. I see. It's just a suggestion. Thank you for the suggestion. It can be more detailed, but that's the main idea. Okay, thanks. I I I, I want I I'm I'm no longer in the field sincerely. So I guess oh. uh, <laughs> maybe maybe it might be more interesting for people at the the the. LSI lab in case they wanted to, to have a master student or somebody working in that direction. I don't know, maybe it might be of interest for them. Okay. Well, it was a Paris LSI. Yeah, the, the Paris LSI, yeah. 
Yeah, I play with this uh, thing. Okay, so we have Jonathan and then Kiron. Jonathan, please. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, I mean, as in the end, you were more or less trying to rediscover some formulas if you have ever tried any symbolic regression. So, I mean, you have some very um, small amounts of data anyway, so maybe um, that could just work. So methods like CISO or something similar where you try to just, I mean, you give it some data and it just gives you a formula out that or the best formula for your data and there's some limitations. Can, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I didn't quite get it. So I was wondering if you ever tried any symbolic regression instead of the, because I mean, you put really a focus on and um, being able to interpret your model yes. and uh, gaining some insights. And so I was wondering, I mean, traditionally neural networks are not the best at that. And we have, um, for example, symbolic regression methods for others that um, might be better suited to that. And I was just wondering if you ever tried something like that. I've never tried that, but no. uh, it's interesting. Definitely interesting. Okay. And another suggestion for my student. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. Um, Kiron, please. Uh, thanks. Um... I guess my question was along similar lines, which is, did anybody try it for something like a four size or a 16 size Hubbard model to see if the conclusions are still true as the system becomes more complicated? Uh -huh. A 16, a 16, a, a what, a 16 size model or what? Y yes, say a 16 size Hubbard chain. Uh, mm -hmm. To see, you know, in which case you don't have, you know, simple analytic solutions. Well, to see indeed. if I may have missed it because I was having my breakfast. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, uh, but in, in in this case, the, the idea was kind of in that direction. So we wanted to to build a more complex models starting from simpler models, and so somehow to use the upper dimer as an auxiliary systems in order to to, to find out the one body reduced density matrix for a case in which uh, there is always a 1D system, but there is uh, a larger number of sites, and this system still populated with just two electrons. So this, this, this is the only thing we did for a more complicated model. And the idea was actually that one, to, to, to try to, to build up more complex systems starting from uh, the, the, the building block that was analytically known. And so the idea was to, to, to raise the, 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 the complexity uh, so to, 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 the, the first to, the first degree of complexity that we could add was to to add uh, sites to this model and then try to get some analytical insights starting from the knowledge we had on the two, two dimer case and again we could have used the, the machine learning as as um, a way to enhance these models and hopefully to 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 kind of explain what, to, to understand what was the analytics behind that we didn't do anything more than these. That was to to, to estimate the, 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 the one body reduced density matrix using dimers per each of diagonal entry. And we actually noticed these things that are that, uh, I mean, there was kind of a, a, a good approximation of some terms. And we gave some qualitative explanation of this reason. But still, I guess there is some. I mean, the, 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 the theoretical calculations behind that are have not been done and might be done at a certain point. Right. And I guess I would have been more interested if, you know, the number of electrons had also gone up with the number of sites so that the sort of interaction parts become much harder. Yeah. Sure. We didn't do that, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, so I don't know if there are other questions. I have a very small one, even if I'm afraid that I won't understand your answer, but I will do it anyway. Um, at the very, towards the end, you've shown a different performances about the activation uh, function. There was a sigmoid and the linear and then the logarithmic, and there was one much better than the others. Now, my understanding was that this um, uh, 
this uh, perception, this this function uh, was there to bring the nonlinearity into the into the game. Yes. And here I see well, different, and I have one that perform much better than the others, but I I have difficulties in understanding why using this uh, logarithm, for example, is much better than than the others. So, because I'm far 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 away from um, this topic. And so just looking at the formula, it's not obvious to me why, why one should work better than the others. Are there any physical things that we can say there? And, and maybe that's obvious and I just didn't get it. Well, I guess, again, um, what we were doing here was, let's, let's go back here. So the idea is this. Uh, all right. This is basically the same thing that happened here because what we want to do is uh, what we wanted to do was to find an off diagonal term as a, a function of the yeah. of the diagonal and we were basically saying okay let's build a perceptron which takes as input the density the density elements that are the inputs and that outputs only this term here so here's the thing if we do that uh, if we if we just use a perceptron, so just a parametric model, and we use some random uh, some 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 activation functions. So these are functions that can be used generally in uh, uh, in any neural network application, or we just take the linear value of that. Well, if we do that, basically we are not inserting any information about the system. Instead, if we if we use the logarithmic perceptron, I just called that way because we introduced that as before. What we're basically doing is uh, instead of feeding this network with the value of the density itself, we're feeding that with the logarithm. Now, again, the, the answer to your question, I guess, is very similar to the answer to this question, which is why the off-diagonal entries are very well estimated by the upper dimer model. Because again, here what we are doing is to introduce the nonlinearity. And the input, and we are feature engineering the inputs in in a way which is which was shown to be uh, very very effective by the study on the upper dimer. And so, the thing is that the reason why this model is learning well is the same reason why the upper dimer approximation of the one body reduced density matrix was quite good. Ah, okay, so it was because also of the, let's say, analytical constraint that was already encoded, and so you could use this. Uh, it, because if you go back a couple of slides, um, um, this was already, um, yeah, one, one, one. Yeah, I know what you want. Yeah. yeah, here, it was already here in some way. Exactly, but the, exactly. So we basically try to use the information we gain while studying the nonlinearity of the upper dimer to try to figure out some, to, to 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 get some insight on the information in the one body reduced density matrix of a more complex object. As the, 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 as people were saying before, it would have been more interesting if it was it would have been with three or more electrons. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. This, in this case, we consider just two electrons in a bigger one dimensional case. And we, we, we basically, with the, the last uh, preliminary analysis, basically what, what we can see is that uh, we are actually introducing some information on the kind of nonlinearity that is present in the system. And th that basically is, is effective for, for, for exactly the same reason as before. Okay, no, no, I get it, it makes sense. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, then, uh, uh, if no other question, we thank Andrea again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.